Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicle Stories of the Supernatural. Once again, I have brought a paranormal expert because that's what you got to call Jason Ofit. Um, he is an author, okay? Uh, and and uh, not only is he an author, he's an author of several books, okay? Uh, most of them nonfiction about different types of you know, paranormal, whether it's shadow people or ghosts or, you know, things of that nature. And uh, we're going to talk not only about his, you know, his books, but we're also going to talk about his own personal experiences. Uh, He grew up in Missouri. And from what he told me, he's done everything. He's been a farmhand, a journalist, a photographer, a bartender, and the mayor of that town. So definitely, (laughs) besides being an author, Jason has done it all. Okay, and he now teaches journalism at Northwest Missouri State University in Maryville. And I love this part, Jason. And keeps the world safe from the forces of evil. (laughs) This is excellent. Uh, Okay, folks, so without further ado, let me bring Jason on and we can get this going. Uh, Jason, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Thank you uh, so very much for having me on. Yes, absolutely. Jason, um, like I said, I, I saw that you have all these books, and I mean, obviously, you're you know you're not strictly an author, or were you know, in your prior life. But I'm going to ask you what I ask all my guests, and and I noticed that you did mention, you know, I looked at a little bit of your bio, that you have had, you know, your own personal encounters with the paranormal or ghosts. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is this is not only strictly based on eyewitnesses or people that you've interviewed or stories that you've read can you tell me or tell us about how this started for you and was it something when you were younger you know like a child or was it something that happened to you as an adult well i had a i had a few things happen minor things happened when i was an adult that i I really can't explain but my interest in the paranormal happened when when i was a child um i grew up on a farm uh, our house uh, was 120, year, uh, 120 years old at the time that, that we were living there when I was a kid. So okay. it was it was an old place. It had been a two room schoolhouse for a lot of its existence. Um, at one day, it was a Saturday afternoon, and I mean I remember this so so clearly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I walked out of my bedroom. I was about eight or nine years old, and I walked out of my bedroom, and there was a hallway that faced my bedroom, and when we kept. Um, all our books there. It was just full of bookshelves, and I was coming out to get to get a book. And when I walked, stepped into the hallway, uh, there was a little boy standing there. Wow! And he was maybe six or seven. He had he had brown hair. It was parted. It was it was kind of kind of messy, uh, like he you know combed it with his hand. Mm-hmm. He was wearing a, he was wearing a blue flannel shirt and blue jeans, and and but that was weird because. You know, growing up in the country, I mean, there there weren't any other little boys around. There wasn't anybody matching that description at all. Right. And uh, the other weird thing is, I could see a bookshelf through him. Okay. <laughs> and we just stood there staring at each other for a while. I mean, it seemed like it seemed like it was a long time, but it was you know, probably fifteen seconds, maybe. Okay. And and then uh, he blinked, and whatever shock that I was in, that blink kind of broke me out of it. And I turned okay. around and, and I walked into my bedroom and I shut the door and I, I didn't talk to anybody about it for about thirty years. Okay. But that, that that got my interest. Like in other words, you were you were like you know, and you know what? A lot of people do that sometimes when they have those experiences. They just like if I don't talk about it then it'll just like you know you know, some people talk about it, some don't. Was it do you think that it was because your family would have not believed you or, or why why do you think you did that? Oh, I'm I'm sure it wouldn't. My family wouldn't have believed me. That's why I didn't do it. Oh, okay. I mean, I I'd, I'd heard all sorts of noises in the house before that point. And whenever I talked to Dad about them, you know, of course it was the house settling. Yeah. So I, I knew if if I said anything about what I saw, that nobody'd believe me. Let me ask you: None of your family years afterwards, nobody's ever confessed that they had their own experiences. No, this uh, it was after after my father passed. I was sitting around with with my mom and my two sisters, and and I actually brought this up. And um, no, nobody ever had an experience like that. It was it was just me. Wow! So you must you were sensitive, you know. And 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 I have heard of that. 
You know, I've heard of both both versions. The one where everybody doesn't say anything, and then years later, once they move out, and especially the kids are adults, everybody then puts forth their version of their experiences. And then you have the one like you're describing where there's just this one target person who actually witnesses and hears everything. And everybody looks at him like, really? Yes, I've heard of that. And that means that you must be sensitive. I mean, you know, you know what I mean? Psychically well, sensitive. Right. And, and I never wanted to be, and I, I still don't consider myself to be, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, because I, I I don't I mean I love I love the, the all of the topics of the paranormal I love researching them and writing writing about them, but but I've always felt this way the paranormal is great as long as it's happening to somebody else. Yes. I yeah, I, I don't really want it to happen to me. I know, and there's a lot of people. That's what I'm saying. That's why I asked you because I you know some people that write about the paranormal they you know they interview people or they hear stories and. But it, as far as firsthand, it's like, no, I haven't and I don't want to either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, but, and you know what? And sometimes, um, how old were you when that happened to you? Uh, I was about eight or nine. Eight or nine. And you know what? Sometimes it's just the age also, you know, that you just don't have all these filters, for lack of a better word, as to what you should or should not be seeing. And maybe that's why you were able to see him and never saw him again. Never, no, I never, never did, and and, and you're you're right about the age because there are, I mean, I mean, I've interviewed hundreds upon hundreds of people um, who, I mean, for who've had various experiences uh, through, through, you know, throughout the different different aspects of the paranormal, and and that does seem to be the be the case. Children will uh, will see things and experience things that that adults in the same room won't have any inkling about. Exactly. Because a lot of them, they're just open. They're just, they just see things, and it's like you saw it. And let me, what, when you saw it, were you scared, or were you, at a, for a minute, they're like, okay. Like you said, you were like probably checking him out. Like, I don't know who this is. And I think the part that you were able to see through him kind of like was giving you a clue. But what was your first instinct? Was it like, who is this kid? It was my, my very first, uh, yeah, my very first thought was, he's not supposed to be here. Right. And then it was... That's a ghost because I can see <laughs> through him, and I mean it's the thing is although that that experience uh, really spurred my interest and you know made me realize that there are things out there that that science doesn't know about. Mm-hmm. I never wanted to know anything else uh, about this guy about this about the ghost, and and I even now I've always. I've always discounted psychics. I've always had a problem with that mm-hmm. and, until I met a couple who told me things that there's no way in hell they could have known. So my, my, my mind's been a little bit more open to that. And, and one of these people who just floored me with the things she was able to tell me s- told me the kid's name and really? then started to tell me about him. And I'm like, please, Joyce, no, I don't want to know anything else. It's, it's before too you personal. Know it, he's going to come back. <laughs> yeah, I just, I I just don't want to know anything. And what did she tell you? Now that you, now you've got me curious, what did she tell you? Well, she told me his name. The, the, the boy. I don't remember the last name. I, I wrote it down, and and then that, that's it. I've, I've lost it. But his, his name was Jacob. Okay. And she said he he died in a farm accident. Okay. Um, really close to the schoolhouse back in uh, the early 1900s. Okay. Because I was curious. I was thinking, you know, usually a child. I mean, you know. I was curious, like, why would he, you know, was it that he had lived there or what had happened to him and things like that. But, and, you know, you, you hear a lot about that, about, you know, a ghost of children. It's almost like, I think sometimes it's the effect of let's, let's scary. It's a kid ghost. But other times you hear about that a lot. And, but you know what? People like you, and I feel the same way about psychics. You know, I've met some that it's like, okay. And others, um, that are very legitimate depending you know everybody's got different levels of sensitivity or or how they come about with their information but yeah i've had those instances myself where it's like i know that there's no way you could get that information and you're telling me something that just just you have to be psychic in other words to know it so fast forward did you ever have another experience after that that you saw in 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 in, in that in that house i mean other than uh, hearing things I couldn't explain, uh, you know, creaks and, you know, sound like somebody walking down the hallway. I mean, other than minor things like that, I never had any other experience in that house. Okay. That house, what is that, does it, that it, mean that you went on to other places it, and you had it? Well, yes, yeah. Well, I'll tell you a, a couple of the, the 
ones that made the biggest biggest impact on me. Okay. Uh, I was at a uh, I was at a friend's house and we were playing cards. Okay. He had he had built the house. As far as he knew, on the piece of land that he bought, there had never been a house there before. All right. Uh, there were just four of us in the house. No no females were in the house. Just four guys playing cards. Okay. The the upstairs was locked. Um, downstairs was it was it was barren. It was just a concrete basement. He hadn't filled it yet, you know, because it's just a relatively new house. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was there was a table, four chairs, and a beer beer fridge. That that was it. Okay. And we're playing cards, and all of a sudden, from the corner of the room that there was nothing in, um, a woman's voice clearly, clearly said, "Victor." Wow. And we all just looked at each other and didn't say anything. Then we finished the hand, and the owner's name was Victor. I was going to say all of the guys there heard it then. All because after after we finished the hand, you know, we asked, "Did you hear it?" Yeah, I heard it. Did you hear it? Hear it? Yeah, I heard it. I heard it. it was a woman's voice. Yeah, he said Victor. Yeah, you bet. So after we finished the hand, uh, you know, three of us got up and just left Victor home alone. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were You're on your own. <laughs> yeah, we were we were done with that. But I I never I never heard a disembodied voice before, and there was no way for that right. to be anybody because there was nobody there. Right. Except for the four of us, and so that 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 made an impression on me. Um, and another incident. Uh, are you familiar with the Axe Murder House of Villisca, Iowa? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, uh, that's about uh, fifty miles north of of where I am. Okay. And um, back in uh, two thousand nine, I offered a class um, at at my university called uh, Paranormal Journalism. It was just a one semester deal. Wow. And I offered it because. I hate the way the mainstream media treats um, stories of the of a paranormal nature. Yes. If if uh, you know if they're UFO sightings, uh, a TV station is going to play the X Files theme in the background. Uh, if <laughs> it's guess. on a if it's a ghost sighting, yes. they're going to reference Ghostbusters. If it's a Bigfoot sighting, they're going to reference Harry and the Hendersons. And uh, yes. and it doesn't matter if the rest of the news story is treated seriously. Yeah. By by dropping those pop culture references, it's making fun of the whole thing. Yeah, it sets it up it, for like it's fiction. Right, right. It's, it's, it's set it up, sets it up for, for ridicule. And, and I wanted to teach these young journalists that every topic is important to treat seriously. And, and paranormal topics are, are as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and well, anyway, just that's the setup of the class. Uh, I took them on a field trip um, to Villisca, Iowa, to the okay. Axe Murder House. All right. And we spent uh, early evening until well after midnight in the house. And I mean, some some weird kind of things happened. Um, uh, you know, a person was tapped on the shoulder, and nobody was standing behind them. Okay. Uh, a girl, uh, a couple of weeks before, had approached me in the hallway and said, "Jason, I had the craziest dream that we were at the the axe murder house." And she described what she saw. She'd never been there, but she described it. And she said, "I went up these really narrow stairs into this, this child's bedroom, and there was a Raggedy Andy doll, a Raggedy Ann doll." And it sat up on the bed and turned its head around and smiled at me. Wow. Okay, she had that dream. Well, we, we get there, and a group of us, it's a small house, a group of us stay downstairs, and a group goes upstairs. Well, she was with the group that went upstairs, and the stairways were really, the stairway was really narrow, just like she described. She went into the uh, in, into the child's bedroom that, that she had seen in her dream, and there was that doll sitting on the bed, just like she dreamt it. Oh, uh, I, she, <laughs> okay. I didn't know about, I didn't know about any of this cause I was downstairs and tear out until I hear this piercing scream and, and run to find her pounding down the stairs, breathing really heavily. I was about to say, how, how quick did she come and want to like exit the house? She zipped down the stairs fast <laughs> and she, she spent a lot of the rest of the time outside, but yeah, that terrified her. Yeah. Yeah. That, that house, uh, that, that was, that was one of the things. The, another thing, the last thing I'll talk about from, from that house that was a solid paranormal experience in, in my eyes, one of my students had brought a Frank's box mm-hmm. and, and for, for people who are not familiar with that, it's a, it's an electronic device that scans the FM dial for static. Right. And the, the basic thought is uh, it will give you real time EVPs instead of recording it on, on an audio device, uh, an audio recording device, you'll, you'll hear the ghost talking to you. Right. Okay, so, uh, one of my students, his, his first name was Stratton and on the bus ride up to Villisca, I said, nobody, 
Be like Zach from uh, Ghost Adventures. Don't yell at the ghosts. <laughs> be respectful. And this kid Stratton said, oh, no, I'm going to yell at the ghosts. Um, I'm going to yell at them. So for the first you know, hour or so, he you know was yelling, you know, come out, cowards, face me, blah, blah, blah. And he's just being really obnoxious. Right. Well, this was well after, and he'd calmed down. And there were a group of us in this large pantry downstairs, and this one – one student had a, had a Frank's box, and he was asking questions like, are we alone in this room? And it was really cold in the room. Okay. And, the, and the, the static went, shh, no. Okay. That answered the question. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. But, you know, I just figured if it's, you know, it's, if it's picking static out of the ether, right. it could pick a no. You know, it could pick a no out. No, no worries. Mm-hmm. So I still didn't believe these things worked. Well, he asked a series of questions, and it answered yes or no, <laughs> yes or no to See, it. See, that's that's the part when it starts getting weird, you know, when it's giving you intelligent answers, you know, not like right. And and it was, and and one of the questions he asked is, "Are you angry with this?" And it went, "Shh, yes." And it was always the same voice. And the guy said, "Who are you angry with?" And there was static, "Shh, Stratton." Oh, oh, God. Did everybody it, like what you could? You heard the crickets going. Rit, 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 rit. We like, froze. We were froze. We didn't talk to the Frank's <laughs> box. Anymore. Oh my because god! Because if it would have been okay, all up, even though it was answering intelligently to those questions, I was still not believing that these things worked. Right. As soon as it named the one kid who was being a jerk, and he had a strange name. If That's it what been, I was about to say. That is not a common name. No, not at not at all. Because of that, it, yeah, I. Made a made a believer out of me that night. Oh my God, that is incredible. And you know, and what's really unusual is that they. I mean, I know they have different theories as to who killed that family. And every time I I, I would read one version, it was like, wow, that sounds plausible. And but then it's like it's if there's a whole bunch of different, you know, suspects that they had, but really no one was ever held accountable for that murder. No, no, no one, no one was was ever caught. No one was ever. I mean, it never. Nobody was ever even taken to trial. Right. It's like they had these suspects, and I mean, it ranged for a lot of different motives. Even though I'm, you know, even to myself, I'm thinking, you know, when you're killing every person in that house, okay, um, including children, it's like, okay, it's like. Maybe the motive is that you had somebody who delighted in killing. That's like the equivalent of a serial killer, you know? Well, Even though yeah, back it, then, they really didn't think of serial killers per se, you know? it's a... Right, but there, I think the, the, the biggest one to me that makes, makes the most sense is uh, a business rival that J.B. Moore right. had. Yes, that he um, had that. Right, and that he just had some some itinerant guy who was coming through town. He's like, "Hey, here's here's a way to make some money. Just butcher everybody in the house." That that's the one to me that makes the most sense. And you know what? And and I have heard, you know, I had heard that that one, and you know, this. And but I'm thinking to myself, but still, at the same time, you know, uh, you know, you're that person that he hired. Let's say, you know, if we're looking at motive per se, you have to be, you have to be. You must have killed a lot of people before then. If somebody gives you money and you go in there and you kill people that you don't even have, know, you know, you don't have anything against them. Plus children, it's like that person that, yeah, that 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 was like the itinerant uh, hitman or something. But right, well, right, and and the way he did it, he killed all of them with the uh, with the black back of the axe, and he he, he killed uh, J B Moore, who was the father, with the blade of the axe. He was the only one he killed with the blade. I didn't know that. I didn't know. Yeah, that. and and he you know covered all the mirrors with with blankets and sheets before he left, which That's was kind of strange. It is. It is. It's like some something going on in the upstairs, but. Yeah, again, it's like, you know, and, and it's real, you know, and you think of it because that's sound, you know, and I think it still is. It's kind of like a smaller town, like out in the middle of nowhere, like usually you would think of these as being crime free, no, nothing like this ever happening, you know, not like usually like larger cities, you know. And right. I and mean, it's it's about 1,200 people. It might have been a little larger than that at the time, but, but I still, can't see it like being nothing. very That's a much... very small, like oh, where everybody tiny knows town. everybody. Right, exactly, and 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 at, at that point there were, I mean, in rural Iowa, I mean, nobody had locks on their doors. Mm-hmm. Um, right after this happened, the, uh, the 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 hardware store in town oh, sold out of locks. I bet. Yeah, I bet that was that. That must have been like, so, 
do you get the sense or when you were all there that what <clears throat> excuse me whatever's there is tied into that murder or i mean i know families uh i mean that happened what at the turn of the century right so yeah 1912, 1912. it happened then um, well, it, and there are um, – yeah, there are uh, – I, I interviewed uh, quite a lot of people. Um, uh, Darwin Lynn is the gentleman. He and his wife, Martha, bought it. Uh, Darwin's since passed. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I interviewed him a couple of times and, and people who – you know from the town and people who have uh, you know, worked in the house because um, it's – you know, it's it, it's a place where, where where people will rent rent the house to do paranormal investigations. So, right, yeah. I mean, I've inter- interviewed a lot of people, and it seems that there are children, child ghosts in the house, and and people uh, wow. when they come and visit will bring toys for the for the child ghost to play with. Um, there's also um, Darwin was convinced that uh, uh, Mrs. Moore was in the house because uh, whenever he was renovating it. Uh, he tried to renovate it back to how it was in in 1912, mm-hmm. um, and you know whenever he did something, and the next day he came in, and you know all the chairs were stacked in in, in the living room, and everything was pushed against the walls. He was pretty convinced that yeah. she was trying to tell him that she didn't like what he'd done to her yeah. house. Yes, and you know, and you hear that so often. Every time people start doing renovations, everything picks up like. And they start getting phenomena going on where maybe before they didn't. But in this case, it's like you have some the usual suspects. Now, let me ask you, considering that, like what you told me, that you were like, you had that experience and it's like, okay, I'll write about it. Or I, in other words, I don't want to have that firsthand experience anymore. How did you end up writing all these books about the paranormal? Well, even though I, I didn't want to really look into it while I was a kid living in that house that I had mm-hmm. the experience in. Right. I mean, but I was, I still wanted to know. Right. I still wanted to find out about, you know, ghosts. Uh, I wanted to find out about, you know, UFOs, about Bigfoot, about, you know, all sorts of different things. Sure. I, I was, I, I was a, um, you know, I, I was, I was, I was, you know, I guess, I don't know if I was a normal kid or a weird kid, but whenever, we got our um, the scholastic book club order forms at school, you know, and friends of mine were ordering books on, you know, biographies on baseball players and, and things like that. I was ordering books on Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. So Let I've me always tell you been something. In- I get it. I get it. I did, yeah. Because I was one of those. <laughs> yeah. I was always interested in, in the topic. And since I had something happen to me personally, yeah. yes, uh, I, I really wanted to, you know, try and find out as much as, as I could about it. Of course, I didn't start researching until I was an adult. And you know what? And that's why I guess it's like, you know, because like I said, you know, a lot of kids, you know, they go through that phase where they read the ghost stories and things or Bigfoot or whatever. And then but then, you know, as they grow up, they kind of leave it behind and they might have some interest. But especially after you had your own firsthand experience, in other words, you pursued it into adulthood, which it's almost like, you know, it's almost like you have that first-hand confirmation. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. It's like, you know what? I could read all these books and everything, and it's great, and it's interesting, but I know this is real. And I think that makes a big difference probably later on when you were talking to people and interviewing them. And and the one thing that I wanted to ask you about, which was I saw that one of your books is about shadow people. Okay. Mm-hmm. And... You in, and I was looking at, and it's true because I've heard so many different interpretations of what are shadow people. Okay, some of them it's like they're human entities. Some of them they're non-human. Some they're evil. Some they're you know, I mean you get a whole. Everybody has a different. You know, some of them they're they just watch you. You know, and other people, it's like, you know, basically they're like the portenders of evil. You know, if you see one, you're like, you're in trouble. Right. Well, there are, well, there are a, a, a whole lot of, I mean, because I interviewed hundreds of people for my book right. on Shadow People. And and I, I came to the con- conclusion that there are so many different types, um, the, the way they behave, the way they look, okay. that, that, they are different types of entities mm-hmm. that just have, you know, a couple of characteristics in common. Okay. Like like the fact that they're shaped generally in, in a human shape, mm-hmm. and they're blacker than night, and right. they also um, 
are a lot of times two dimensional, which is, is is interesting. But mm-hmm. but they're but uh, not all of them look the same, and not all of them act the same. So it it has led me to believe that they're they're just a few different types of entities instead of just one thing. Let me ask you, do you think there's an overlapping where some people, you know, I'm sure you've heard of Hat Man, right? Where, right, that's one of the chapters in my book, yes. Right, so they kind of like, you know, because I've heard some people say, well, they see Hat Man, but as a shadow. You know what I'm saying? So it's like Shadow Man, Hat Man, all like merged together. Um, well, it's well, it's 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 all of the, the, the shadow people have this, this, this in common is that they're uh, blacker than night human shaped shadows. Um, and that's that's it. That's that's what's in common. Okay. Um, so I mean, they don't they don't have features. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might see a nose on silhouette, but I mean, you can't see any facial features at all. Okay. Um, they're general generally uh, taller than they should be. There's there's something off about them. Maybe their legs are longer than than you know out of proportion, or their arms are out of proportion, or their right. head is. Uh, most the most common uh, occurrence of shadow people is uh, just the. They're bald, <laughs> and you can't tell right. if, if if they have clothes on or not. They're just shaped like people, right. and they tend not to notice anyone. I, I refer to these as benign shadows mm-hmm. because they don't take any notice to people. It's like they're walking from point A to point B, okay. and maybe your house is in the way, or maybe they pass you on the street, and that's just the way they're going, and they don't take any stock of you. Okay. Okay. Uh, other types, uh, the hat man, which is that same basic description, except for he looks like he's wearing a fedora. Okay. Uh, some some people have have reported that he looked the shadow person or that the, the hat man looks like he's wearing an uh, you know an old fashioned suit you know like, like a gangster from a Humphrey Bogart movie right okay um, some uh, there are some shadow people that have uh, blazing red eyes yes I've heard um, that right oh uh, and my toddler just came into the room <laughs> I don't know if you can hear. Um, there have been very few cases, but I have gotten some to where uh, the shadow person um, is smaller and is dressed in a monk's cowl. Yes, you know, I like have the heard of that. Paper. I have heard of that too. Okay, yeah, and and all of these, the the behavior is 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 different. Um, mm-hmm. With with uh, like I said, the, the the benign shadows, they don't take any they don't take any stock uh, in in people. Uh, the hat man uh, tends to look at people. Um, Right. In you other know, words, be aware of them. They're aware of people, and if people are aware that the Hat Man's aware of them, mm-hmm. you know, the Hat Man it acts kind of surprised, like you can see me. Yeah. And and sometimes backs away. Um, I yeah. there was one one case I, I interviewed a gentleman who when he was eighteen he was in his living room and he looked uh, in 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 the doorway that separated the living room from the kitchen and it was it was in broad daylight it was in the middle of the day. And this hat man was standing there. Again, he couldn't make out any features whatsoever other than the silhouette. And the hat man seemed to be surprised that this guy could see him. And he turned, turned, turned and took off running through the kitchen. And, and the, this, this 18-year-old heard a crash. Uh-huh. And he ran into the kitchen in time to see the, the, the shadow man jump off the back deck. And there were no stairs on the back deck. And the back uh- deck was like 18 feet off the ground. Wow. Um, but the crash was glass. There was glass on the f- kitchen floor. Okay. He'd run. He'd run through the, sh- the 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 sliding glass back door to the porch that was double paned, and the inside pane busted, and the the outside pane did not. Wow! Because you know what? Right. I have heard. You know, you hear a lot of people like when they're experiencing a haunting that they'll hear crashing glass. Like you know, everything is demolished, but when they get there, everything is fine. But in his case, he actually saw everything was broken. Right, and it was like I said, it was a double. It was double pane glass, and the inside wow. pane was broken, and the outside pane was not. But it, it was obvious the shadow person had run, run through it. Well, and that, and then that's that's the the hat man. The 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 other two types, the um the the one with the, with the monk's cowl and yes. and the uh, the one with the blazing red eyes, these two tend to be a little bit more invasive. mm Hmm. And they will definitely, you know, approach people. People will wake up to see them looming over their bed and they will feel not just a a normal fear, but to them, to them, they described, they described it to me as to them. It was like the shadow person was evoking a greater fear inside them and it was feeding off of it. Okay. 
Right. Right. So, I mean, what 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 are what are all these all these things? Um, you know, the 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 benign ones to me. Um, I mean, how do you how do you how do you how do you prove this? But to me, it seemed like maybe you know it, it's there. It's an inter, interdimensional thing, and and they yes. don't know we can see us, and they can't they can't see us, and they don't know right. that we're even there. Um, the uh, the Hat Man, I'm I'm not really sure what to think. The ones that that seem to, to feed off of our fear. Uh, I when I was researching the book, I, I interviewed. Um, Experts in in uh, Catholicism and in Islam and and Hinduism, Buddha, Buddhism. Uh, I interviewed a, uh, a Cherokee shaman. Okay. And, and in in all of these religious belief systems, that they have these entities, and okay. they're 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 evil. <laughs> all of them. I was about to say, and I know in a lot of those, like like that that darker than dark thing, is like, um, and you know what. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, you know, the, you know, the author Dean Koontz that he wrote yeah, sure that am, Odd yes. Thomas, uh, well, there's like, he's got, I think, five or six books out. And you know that he's got some version almost of like shadow people or things in there, which to me was very scary. But basically it was the same thing. They only appear where there was going to be like uh, human suffering and death and, you know, agony, in other words, and... It was really funny because in that book, that, that the main character, Odd Thomas, it was he could see them because part of his abilities that he can see the the dead people is that as long as they didn't realize he could see them, he was fine. But once, like in other words, he knew I could never let them know that I can see them, and I wonder if that holds true for some of these things for the shadow people. That's why I said, you know. Um, Almost, did you, did you did you ever find that in some cases people would see them? Let's say, like the Mothman prior to a catastrophe. Did you ever hear of anything like that? I'm not going to say prior to a catastrophe. Well, what I mean uh, is like, like something big, but prior to to a death. Okay, and and that's that's part of the mo of 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 some of these shadow people is that people will see them before a death. Uh, I talked okay. with one woman who saw over a few days time uh this shadow entity and sometimes it was during the day sometimes it was night okay. but standing next to a lamp post across the street wow and she she said that it was like he was staring at the house across the street okay well the day she stopped seeing him an ambulance pulled up because the the older uh the elderly lady who lived there had died Ooh. yeah i uh, uh got an email from a woman whose husband had had um he was in stage four uh liver cancer and uh he kept talking about these shadow beings okay. that were you know huddled around his bed you know and this scared him to the point where he convinced her she didn't want to do this but he convinced her to put him in the car and drive really so she drove about 150 miles away he just wanted to get away from them he wanted to hide from them right so they drove about 150 miles away and and she got a hotel room and they were still there they they'd followed they were, and they oh were just standing God. around the bed staring at him um and and this is this is the sort of thing that that is in you know, uh, uh, American Indian, uh, some American Indian tribe belief systems that these these entities are are uh, negative omens and they they foretell death. Okay, and you know what? I want to tell you my own little story. I remember <clears throat> this was back in the 1980s, and I would always be, you know, reading all these different ghost story books and whatever. You know, back then it was not like before, but I remember this was like a book. I think it was written in the 40s and 50s, <clears throat> and part of it's. T- takes place it's, it's like you know anthology of true stories and one of them takes place i think it was in greenwich village or something like that where this couple that rents an apartment they keep seeing a guy dressed like going to opera with a top hat and the you know the cloak the whole thing and he's the ghost you know and that that was like a little short story um then i'm not kidding you and that's what i'm saying it's like Within like a month or less, one day I'm talking to a girl that I worked with. I can't remember how the conversation comes up. But this thing about ghosts, like I was, it's like, if you mentioned the word, I'd be like, yeah, really? She starts telling me how she had her own experience when she was like in her late teens where she was telling me, oh, yeah, so I see things and I don't really want to see things. And I said, well, like, what's the, what's the word? She goes, and she lived like in this little tiny apartment with her parents. She was the only kid. This one time I woke up. And there was a guy at the foot of the bed, and he was dressed with his top hat on. And I'm like, what? You know, it was like the exact description, 
okay? And she said something similar to what she, you said. She couldn't make out the features per se, but she had like a small room and he was standing at the foot of the bed so she could see that he had like a top hat. You know, it wasn't a hood. And I remember it was like, what are the chances? I mean, somebody in a top hat, let's put it this way, a ghost in a top hat, Think talk about the most unusual or out of place apparition it would have been for her in her apartment to see that where she lived with her parents. And she said, I was, the feeling I got from it was so, so bad. She goes, it, um, it was horrendous. And then she tells me like that within like a year or less, her mom, which had a heart condition passed away, you know, and that's why I was wondering, that's why I asked you, um, you know, had you ever come across these these eyewitnesses where they there was a correlation between you know seeing shadow people and then something bad coming like you know right well yeah yeah absolutely and i'll I'll tell you another story a woman uh, i worked with um who knew i mean this is before i i wrote any books on on the paranormal but she um knew I was interested in this sort of thing. And, and she started telling me that she was seeing this dark figure out of the corner of her eye. And when she turned her head, it wasn't there. Okay. And, and that it kept getting closer into her vision, not just in the corner of her eye. It was more in her vision. Mm-hmm. Then she discovered her, her uh, discovered her husband had esophageal cancer. Ooh. And, you know, it kept getting more prominent and more prominent. And when her husband finally passed, um, the, the, the black, sh- the shadow figure uh, stopped appearing to her. Right. And see, those are the things that it's like, that's, that's very like, like you said, I know there's different inter- interpretations. Like you said, there's some people that all they do is they see, well, I'll see them in the corner and, but that's it. You know, that's the extent of it. It's just scary, but you know, they don't, nothing bad comes of it. In other words, it's just scary because they're seeing something, but then you have the other ones that they like, that they make a, that appearance right then. And then right after something bad happens and then. And then you, I've heard of also of other people that they get followed, like you said, like what happened to that man who was uh, basically dying and his wife takes him 100, over 100 miles away and they're still there. You know, I've heard of people that move from house to house and, you know, the sightings of these things follows them around. And it's always well, like, I had, go ahead. I'm right. Sorry. Well, right. No, well, that I had a, uh, uh, a student um, who was telling me a story of, of, of a hat man that he and his brother would see in their house as they were growing up. They, uh, he and his brother had a, a bedroom in the basement, and uh, sometimes at night, this they'd see this shadow figure with a hat. They, when they were younger, they they dubbed him the cowboy because okay. of the hat, and and this thing would pace on one end of the room. It's like he couldn't go across a line or something. He just mm-hmm. paced back and forth, and you know they were eventually got used to him. Okay, um, and then he. Graduated from high school and, and went to college, and um, he, he said he, he's one of those people who always slept with a, with a fan on, okay. which, yeah, I know a lot of people who do that. And he said that he started hearing in his fan, you know, music like it came out of the 20s. Okay. And, and he thought, you know, that was pretty bizarre because he turned the fan off and there wouldn't be any music. But then he started oh, okay. seeing he, – he, he would occasionally see this, uh, this, this cowboy in his room. And he figured, wow. like, okay, it's it's found me, <laughs> it, it yeah. found me. Um, and then when he when he graduated, he moved to Kansas City. Well, he was from Omaha, Nebraska, and he said one uh, one day he was went back to Nebraska, and he was at at a shopping mall, and he went to his car, and uh, it, you know he was sitting in his car, and his car wouldn't start, and he was upset because he didn't know about cars, but his mom did, so he started to call his mom to ask advice. And he heard a tapping on the, his car window, and this was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. And he turned to look to see who was tapping on his window, and it was the cowboy. Oh my god! <laughs> in, in broad daylight, in a mall parking lot. I was about to say this was in the middle of the afternoon. Right, and he stared at it, you know, scared to death, and it just faded away. And he thought that, you know, what it was doing was 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 telling him that, you know, I'm still here. Well, so I was about to say this thing had been following him like everywhere then. Right. Wow. Which is terrifying. <laughs> yes, it is. It All is. Right. It is. You know, and it's like, you know, and I, 
and you know sometimes i you know i've told people you know everybody thinks sometimes that ghosts are only attached to places and some of them are attached to people or they're not attached at all they can they can follow you around you know if uh and i remember one time um i did my own investigation we had a a family they were moving out of state uh they were moving to north carolina out of florida and they called us in and they and they explained to us that they had bought the house a few years back and they said that Later on, the real estate agent told them the story that when they were about to, that the family that was living there, that she says that they were very religious and they, they themselves found a bunch of angel statuaries outside, inside that they left there. They didn't take it with them. And that real estate agent told them, you know, that right when um, we were about to leave for the closing, they, uh, they all made me get in a prayer group, even though I'm Jewish. <laughs> And pray in a Christian in a Christian prayer, which she says she didn't care about the closing, but she thought it was like really weird because it was like very like intense. <laughs> and then, you know, after the closing, the new family, which is the ones that contacted us, they told us, you know, when we got here, there was like angels everywhere, outside, inside, whatever. And uh, what they were experiencing was that they kept having something come through the backyard okay and they even had the neighbors and they had phenomena where you know the sliding glass door would shake like somebody was trying to get in there or one of the bedrooms that had a window to the back same thing you know we had a lot we we captured a lot of phenomena but believe it or not their main concern was that this thing did not follow them they have as a matter of fact they had just sold the house they had just sold the house and they were going to be moving like within the the month. They were packing their stuff and going to to North Carolina, and they were, that was what concerned them the most, that this this ghost was going to travel with them to the new house, you know. Well, and, and I've I, interviewed plenty of people who've who've had that happen to them. Yeah, which which is it's unsettling. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I'm not going to go into it, but there was a lot of things that happened to them there, and you know, enough that they. Like, in other words, that like, like when they moved in and they saw this angel stuff, like they didn't get it, you know, even after the real estate agent told them that story, they still, they were like, okay. And then they had various experiences in like the three or four years that they lived in the house to the point that they were like, you know, and, th- and then we kind of like basically came to the, to the understanding that that family back there had done some either prayer banishment to where this thing couldn't come in the house, but was basically outside in the backyard. And that's why they kept having those problems with the back door and then as a matter of fact the uh <clears throat> both adjoining yards on either neighbor there was no fence and i we spoke to both neighbors on each side and they both confirmed that every once in a while they would see this lady would have look like a young teenage girl like walking through from one yard to the next you know so you know <laughs> they they were and they they really and we said well you know if you get up there call us and maybe we could you know if this still persists and you know we could refer you to somebody up there and we never heard from them again which leads me to believe that whoever bought that house inherited a ghost <laughs> so yeah well and you know the the thing is is that uh, in in some states and I know New York and California are like this uh, the seller has to dis- disclose <laughs> if the house is haunted yeah i've heard that some yeah. states and there is a website. I'm trying to think. I think it's Died in House or Died in the House or something like that. Where basically you can plug in an address and find out if you've had any deaths or what's worse. Because, you know, they, they kind of give examples where, you know, sometimes, especially if you have an older house, you know, once upon a time people would actually die in the house, you know. They, but where you've had like murders or, you know, like really horrible stuff happen. And well, right, well, and, and if a house is is is, I mean, turn of the century. I mean, even uh, I mean, back then, um, that's where they had you know visitations. That's where they had the funeral. Yeah. They just have the body sitting out in the living room. Yeah, you had to, you had to, did the wake in the either the parlor, or the living room, or wherever because you know that's just the way it was. But uh, what I thought was interesting when I saw that was that sometimes even the houses are not that old, but you'd be surprised, even though sometimes 
things that happen there are horrific and it makes the news. There's a lot of buyers that sometimes are coming from out of the area or out of state that have no clue, okay? For example, that a family of five got killed, you know, in the house. And like you said, you know, certain states, you know, make the the seller tell and i believe others is if the person asks or something like that but well i think uh, most states have uh, uh you have to a disclosure if there was a murder a suicide oh really or if um uh if the person who'd lived in the house had had it had had aids you, you have to disclose that really but there are very there, there are a few a few states like i said california and new york i know i know that uh, yeah i know that there's some that's mandatory so it's mandatory. If you think your house is haunted, <laughs> you, you got to disclose that as well. So if, whatever you do, don't call a paranormal team <laughs> because yeah. that's right there is your admission that you think it's haunted. Exactly. I mean, you could play along and say, no, I never thought it was haunted. It was like, <laughs> but yeah, and it's, and it's incredible because once upon a time, people just didn't talk about that. And that's why you would have people move into houses and they would have all these, you know, all these experiences and then when they start investigating they find out that you know the house has been sold and bought like a bunch of times and but they would only find out about it after the fact so well let's let's go back back to Velisco when i was doing my research on that there was um um <laughs> there, you know there were people it became a rental house after after the moors died and and there was one family that moved in that the husband was so terrified of the house He'd sleep in a shed <laughs> behind the house. You know what? And do you think that it would keep? Do you think that it became a rental house because nobody wanted to buy it? Uh, probably, probably did, because okay. it was a rental house for a long time. Yeah, that makes sense to me. This is because um, uh, I do. I don't. I can't remember one show that it interviewed the adult, or who, who are now adults, but were children, like you said, and they rented there. In other words, they lived. For a period of time there when they were like, I want to say 12 or 13 or 9, 10, you know, they, they interviewed them. They had their own experience. But I remember, yeah, that it was like a rental. Um, and I can see that. And and uh, I know that there was a gentleman that was a neighbor that he he got really caught up in this story of what happened to that family and the house and the whole thing, you know, that he was like, did a bunch of uh for lack of a better word, when you when you hear what happened to him, you want to think like almost the house possessed him because he was so caught up. In right. what yeah, and to I, that I can't think of his, I can't think of his think of his name, but I, I I've spoken with him. I, I know who you're talking about. Right, I can't remember his name either. But you know, and it's like it makes you wonder. Is, you know, is it? You know, is there something there that these ghosts want to have brought out so that the truth is known or is this old on his end? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it could be, could be either. <laughs> could be either. And let me ask you, have you had, have you investigated any other locations like that close to your area like that, that uh, were either well, scenes of tragedy and then became supposedly haunted or, or, or anything like that? Well, I, yeah, in, in uh, well, especially in my my first book of the paranormal, uh, Haunted Missouri. I it, it's a um, it, it's a it's a tour book, tour, haunted tour book of my state. Oh, okay. Um, because I'd read a whole lot of, uh, of I've read a, a whole lot of books about about hauntings, and and um, a lot of the hauntings were in private residences, and mm-hmm. and I wanted to write one of these books, but I wanted to write a book where people could actually go to these haunted spots because, right. you know, if they're private residences, I, I didn't want to write about a place, yeah. you know, and have people staring in the window at three o'clock in the morning. Sure. That wouldn't be good. So yeah, I, I've, I've, you know, it, um, you know, interviewed people on, on a, on a, you know, a ton of these. Um, one of, one of the, the cool ones is, um, Mark Twain cave in, uh, in Hannibal. Oh, it, um, uh, Twain even wrote about this in his in his uh, autobiography, Life on the Mississippi. Okay. Um, the the, ha- or the 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 cave was discovered uh, when Twain was was little, and uh, the townspeople, uh, the the children, um, the children decided, you know what, this is fun. Okay. We need to go inside this cave. And the older ones would take the younger ones in there and scare the you know scare the pants off of them. Okay. Uh, it, it got worse during Twain's time uh, when he was you know one of those who would go to the cave because uh, a surgeon from St. Louis 
had purchased the cave because he was trying to figure out a way to perfectly preserve a human body. Okay. And he needed a few things. One of the things was a human body. The okay. other thing was um, a, a place to store the body that had constant temperature, constant humidity, okay. which is what this cave system had. Okay, that makes and, sense. Yeah, it's constant humidity, and it's like 52 degrees all year round. So what, what he what, – unfortunately, the body he found is when his 14-year-old daughter died of pneumonia. Oh, my God. Okay. And, and what he did is he devised this um, – tank uh, a copper tank with with uh with with a glass cylinder in the middle and he put his daughter in it and filled it up with this solution of alcohol and other things and suspended it from the roof of a room in one of these one of these caves and the the children of of hannibal would take you know the bigger ones would take the little ones and they'd tell ghost stories as they walk through the caves with their torches and lanterns and they end, end up back in this room <laughs> and when they were in this room, one of the older boys would unscrew the lid and pull this 14-year-old girl's head out of the water or out of the <laughs> solution. And, of course, the little kids would scream bloody I murder bet. and move home. <laughs> oh, my and God. And the parents in Hannibal uh, got so sick of this, they, they convinced the, the surgeon to uh, take his daughter and bury her. But really? when, after it became a show cave, I think it was in the 60s, maybe the 70s, People started seeing this 14-year-old girl wandering around. I, I've, I talked to a number of, of tour guides and former oh. tour guides who uh, saw this girl. One specifically was telling me that there's a girl who joined the, the tour inside the cave, joined it late, and he had no idea how she ended up there. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, she started – she was making faces at him during the whole thing. Okay. And at the, at the end of, of the tour – she walked off into this room that nobody was let into that. And, and he followed her in there because, you know, the, the tour was over. Yeah, like, where are you going? The, the room was empty, but there was, there was documentation in the room and there was actually a picture in there of the girl. And he was like, this oh was God. the girl who's been making faces at me. Let me tell you something. He must've had a moment right then and there. Like, do I really want to work here anymore? Hmm. Let me think about this. I yeah. I don't know how much longer he worked there, but I that when I talked to him, he was a former tour guide. You know, and you know what? Sometimes those are the people because the tour guides, I mean, you'll go through tours and tours and tours and nothing happens. And then it's the people that are constantly there day after day that they have those experiences that they're like, okay, you know, because that's the thing about the paranormal. Sometimes days will go by and nothing ever happens. Nobody sees anything, you know, and right. then the people. That and that's what there. I tell people when they're asking me, Jason, I want to go on this ghost hunt. I'm like, okay, have fun, but just realize you're not going to experience anything. Yeah. If you do, you're lucky, but most yeah, exactly. of the time, yeah, you're not going to experience a I, thing. I call it the 80-20 split. 80% chance you're not going to see anything. 20% chance you might hear or maybe see something. <laughs> but in other words, you know, it's – and and I find that, that that also happens like exactly like what you said when people are doing it on purpose, not the person that's doing something that they have no intention or they're not looking for any type of ghost or anything. And then they have the experience. That's the ones that happens to a lot, you know. Right, right. The ones who aren't looking for it. Yeah, I agree. With, I found that too. I agree with that completely. You know, and some that even initially, they don't realize that they're dealing with a ghost. They're like, oh, like, you know, what is that? Or who is that? Or, you know, things like that. And then later on, they realize through one way or another, either the, the apparition walks into the wall or, or they're told, no, there's no person like that here that they're like, oh, okay. You know, and to me, I love those stories because I think those are the ones that are very valid versus, you know, the people that, that are out there chasing the poor ghosts, which I think nine times out of ten, they like hightail it. They like make themselves scarce, like I'm getting out of here. These people are too noisy. Right. right. Well, right. That's and, that, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, because people have asked me about uh, ghosts, you know, why do they, you know, show up more at night? And I'm thinking I've, I've always thought that they don't. It's just that, you know, it's quieter. Yes. People are paying more attention. You know, they're mm -hmm. not. So, I mean, they, they tend to turn up more just because of that. Well, and and this is, and, 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 you know, and nowadays, you know, like everybody and their cousin wants to do uh, paranormal investigations. And, you know, besides the, and this is my own personal belief based on my experience and everything. You know, yeah, you know, sometimes you go in there and really it's a waste of time. 
But I, um, you know, I have a problem, though, with those people that end up going to uh, cemeteries. But sometimes they get more than they bargain for. They really do. Okay. I, I, I've heard too many stories of people going into cemeteries, just like nothing better to do. Let's do some stupid stuff. And then they, they start having really unusual and, for lack of a better word, sinister stuff happen to them after that. Right. You yeah. Know. Cemeteries aren't anything to play to play around in whatsoever. Um, and, and a lot of people don't don't realize that uh, most cemeteries, unless they're marked otherwise, I mean, even if the cemetery is not marked, uh, if you're there after du- after du- after dusk and before dawn, right. you know, when it's still dark, you're, you're trespassing. Yes. And you know, pe- people generally don't realize that, but uh, uh, you could get in some legal trouble by yeah. by going into cemeteries at night. And and one of the one of the other things, um, you know, that a lot of you know rookies will do when they go to a cemetery is uh, they will just go at night. And when they get scared and start to run, they'll trip over things they wouldn't noticed if they would have went during the day. Oh, of course, because you know you and you got you know believe it or not they, they don't understand a lot of those gravestones. Not all of them are upright. Some of them are flat or they've fallen over. Or you've just all you need is a little chunk of stone, and that's it. You're gonna like eat dirt. You know. Yeah. But yeah, and I, I've had a lot of you know people that, you know, it's uh, sometimes when they call you for paranormal investigations, you know, one of the things you ask them is like, well, when did this start? What happened? You know, and I tell everybody, and I say a lot of paranormal investigators don't do this. First of all, I interview everybody in the household separately and. I don't take them into another room. I take them outside of the house, out of earshot, true earshot. Because I've learned over time that you will hear stuff that you would never hear if you just took them to the next room over where they think they might be overheard. Right. Okay? Yeah, right. Absolutely. And that's when people will tell you, oh, I did this or I did that or, well, you know what? I've been seeing this and and, be, and I tell them, look, whatever you tell me, I'm going to keep it to myself. All I'm trying to do is help you, you know, help you guys out. And then that's when you hear about I went to the cemetery, you know, or I did this. And it was like, okay, thinking back, was this, did things start happening after this? Well, yeah, kind of. There you go. That's why I'm saying a lot of these times, these cemetery visits turn into like a nightmare. And then some of them, especially if they're teenagers, they don't really want to tell their parents like, hey, I was goofing around out in the cemetery or we went with a Ouija board and all that crap. And and it's like, okay, you know, but. Unfortunately, yeah, that, 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 you know, and and don't get me wrong. I remember when I was a teenager and, you know, that there was that fascination. But like you said, all the cemeteries where I grew up at, uh, I think it was by 6 or 7 p.m., they would close those gates down and you weren't getting in there, you know. So, you know, in in a way, I understand totally uh, the attraction, you know, but knowing what I know now, I think that, um, and I know it sounds like, you know, you're shaking your finger at these young teenagers, you know, like the Scooby-Doo, you, you kids, mm. you know, mm. but it, and, and, and like I tell them a lot of times when things like this happen of this, it doesn't, it doesn't happen like a clap of thunder. It's very slow moving. Okay. They'll come back and nothing happens for a few days. And then they start going into the, oh, I feel like somebody's watching me or have bad dreams. And then it starts to like, kind of like develop but sometimes it takes weeks to get to the point that some of them are thinking that they're like losing their mind you know especially if they don't want to tell their parents or they don't want to tell somebody else that they're experiencing all these things and usually um until it gets to the point where they bust out and they start telling the truth because they're so scared and that's why i say if you think that it's like the hollywood version that you go to the cemetery and three days later you know, you you got furniture flying around your house. And I go, no, it's not. It's a lot more, I don't want to use that word, but I'm going to use it insidious as to how it creeps in to your reality. Okay. And I said, and that unfortunately is the hallmark of malevolent paranormal influence, you know. And, and, and one of the things, right, and, and I, I, I agree with that completely because I've interviewed so many people that have, that have had this happen to them. Um, one of the things that I think I've, I've escaped having that happen for the most part is, is the fact that I'm, I'm a journalist by trade. That's, that's what I did uh, for most of my career, and that's what I teach now. I teach journalism. Right. And 
I don't go into anything. I don't walk into any situation. I don't, um, you know, step into a cemetery or any haunted building uh, looking for anything. Right. I'm I'm a journalist. I'm there to interview people. I'm there to uh, experience, um, you know, the house. I mean, here to, you know, I want to see where the where the woman, you know, took took an overdose of morphine in you know 1898. You know, I want to see that spot. I I, right. I want to be able to describe the surroundings. I want to do that. I'm not in there looking for ghosts. I'm not there looking for trouble. I don't want to attract anybody anything's attention. So I've I've generally generally missed out on uh, fortunately missed out on on attracting well, any attention. And you and you know what, Jason, you get a lot of people, and I'm not even going to say teenagers because there's a lot of adults that they seek out that that um, I don't want to say confrontation. They they want that involvement. They they want to have that. It's not only the confirmation. They like, you know, I want to take it home with me. You know, <laughs> yeah, have and fun with that. I'm like, you know, you know what. Because, like I said, I, I've been doing stuff in the paranormal since the 1990s. And I, for me, there was always a very, very strong boundary between what I went and I did outside of my house as to what came home with. You know, I was very, there was no gray area. I did not want anybody coming home with me. I was not, the, you know, it was, if I went out, it was something that I went out and I did. But. As far as my personal space, my home, there was a very strong boundary there. I had no interest whatsoever in having that firsthand experience um, that, you know, you see some people have about, you know, oh, I, we've got a ghost. And, 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 you know, it's really funny because, you know, I've had other paranormal investigators on and they all tell me the same thing. Lately, when they get called in for people that on the phone or on email tell you they're really scared and they're concerned and please hurry, that when they get there, they find out these people are all happy because they think that they've got a ghost. And really what they want is for this team to come in and confirm it and possibly identify who it is and what they want. But under no, it's like, what happened to the, I'm scared, quick, come over. And that happens a lot, you know, mm-hmm. where it's like, uh, you know, we have the pet ghost, oh, you know, things like that. And it's like, okay, that's, and I, I tell them, I, I got to the point towards the end where when I interviewed them, I would ask them, what are your expectations? What do you want for us to do for you if it turns out that you do have something paranormal going on? You know, like I, I started to clarify it up front because of that. And, you know, I think reality TV and all these shows have a lot to do with it. And um, believe it or not, I had a couple of times, um, you know, a couple of families that, you know, we would tell them, I would tell them, you know what, uh, this is, you know, it would turn out that, yes, that there was something supernatural going on. And we would tell them and I would tell them, look, I don't think it's a good idea that you want to like, you know, keep your pet ghost or this thing. It's, you know, sometimes this can really get out of hand. And sure enough, I had a couple of times that like within the year, we would get phone calls from them saying, hey, you know what? No more laughing. It was there was no more. It was not it was not a great idea anymore. Hey, can you guys come back out? Because now it's taken a different tone. And I was like, OK, I knew it. You know, and a lot of people don't once that happens, what they end up doing is they just move away. You know, hope, you know, that kind of deal. Like, OK, mm hmm. You know, like, like, you know, when you get the dog you don't want anymore, you just take it to the pound. Well, okay, we'll just move away. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, people don't, I mean, they, they think it's fun and games to start with, which it, it it's not, ever. <laughs> well, no, it's not. And and let me ask you, um, because I know that, I mean, you are not only into the, the paranormal, the sense of the ghosts, you're also... You're like what you, you you're a self described nerd. I'm not, and I say that, and I consider myself a nerd also. So that's why it's not. Oh yeah, I have no problem with that. Term. Uh, okay, <laughs> you know, um, and that you know that you're also into all these like the the UFO sightings and cryptids and all that. Have you ever had any experiences firsthand along those areas? Uh, cryptids, no. Which I. <sighs> Kind of not happy with, mostly happy with, because I think if I ran into a you know, eight, <laughs> eight foot tall, five hundred you know five hundred pound you know uh, you know Bigfoot, it might scare the hell out of me. But um, yeah, I've 
you know, I think we've all probably seen things in the sky. We're not sure what they are, but, you know, most probably it's, it's something that can be explained. But there was one time, I was about 15 years old, and it was it was planting season, so dad worked late. And uh, okay. he got home, and it was after dark. I heard his truck pull up and turn off and the door shut, but he didn't come in. And I went I went outside to see what was wrong, mm-hmm. and he was leaning against the side of his pickup, and there's a field between us and the nearest house. The nearest house was, I don't know, maybe three-quarters of a mile to a mile away. Okay. And I said, what's wrong? And he pointed out into the sky over the field and said, you see that? And there was a spot in in the sky. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it was a cl- it was cloudless night. And, you know, living out in the country, you can see stars like crazy. There, uh, it's, it's not like living in a city where you've got competing, you know, there's a lot of light noise. There's just, you can see there's star, stars as many as you can. But there was this one spot. <laughs> it was a circle and it was black, totally black. And okay. you could tell that there was, there was something there blocking blocking the stars. Okay. And we just we just stood there for a while, and we could hear a hum. Wow. And he said, Jason, go in the house and get your mother. Well, I went in the house and got mom, and she came out and saw it. And then the phone rang, and I ran in the house to answer it, and it was our neighbor across the farm field. And he was like, oh. do you see that thing over the field? Do you see that black hole in the sky? So, oh. I mean, he saw it too, and we stayed outside and, and watched, and eventually – I guess it started rising because it got smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually disappeared. Okay. I can't explain that. Right, exactly. And that's what, I, you know, and exactly. It's not like what we described before. It's not like your parents or you or anybody was looking to have this. But again, like after you like cross off all the possible possibilities, what are you left with? Right. And, you know, it also made me wonder that, I mean, how many people are having these experiences all the time? But uh, they they're could have these experiences all the time. They just they don't pay enough attention. <laughs> they don't just don't see. Yeah, that I spot agree in with the you. Sky. I they agree don't with you. hear that 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 hum. You know, and, and the more we're connected into into electronics, the oh, the, the less it. of those we might have. Oh yeah, I mean, well, I mean nowadays, like, what was it when? Um, oh my God, that game that came out not lot too long uh, long ago. The the one where you had to. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm Pokemon to... Go. Pokemon. Po- that people Pokemon were tripping. Go. They were walking into traffic, you know? Right, right. And it's like, um, yeah, unfortunately, I agree. I agree with you on that. It's that people's like, they're, 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 they're like about, it's like this right here. And as a matter of fact, the other day I was, I don't know if I read it or I was listening to something that they have been doing sleep studies on people and that people in their sleep, they're even, you know how like some, you know, some people that they, you kind of like redo what you did during the day where, where they saw that people are doing basically a sleep that, you know, bringing the, oh, the hand, hand, to hand in front face. of their face. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, like huh. basically you're mimicking, you know, in sleep what you're doing during the day. And they, it wasn't like one person. They saw a bunch of people. Oh, that's that, sad. And it was like that speaks directly to what you just talked about, which is that concentration, that focus. And, of course, everything else is like you know, can fall off the face of the earth and you're not aware of it. You know, right. and I, I, I told, I told my students once, um, this class, cause uh, people, they're on their phones all the time. Mm-hmm. And I told my class, I, I said, you know what, if there's a solar flare, a big one that knocks out all our communication satellites, you, you guys are going to be laying, you're going to be laying on the floor in the fetal position drooling. Uh, I'll try not to step on you. Yeah, you're right though. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you're right. You're absolutely right. You know, you know, to me, I, I, I'm not, you know, for example, and I understand what you're saying. I mean, yeah, you're inconvenienced because let's say your cable doesn't work. But, you know, since I'm older, I came from once upon a time before the even computers, you know, were like, pick up a book and read. Whoa. You know? <laughs> Things right, like that. Right. You know? Well, and it's uh, I'm I'm actually my you know because I'm 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 around college students all the time and and they completely ignore each other because their faces are in their phones. But there, there are a lot of people I see holding books, reading reading books, which mm-hmm. uh, which makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, it's like if all else fails, 
Let me tell you something. I, even now, I always have a book handy in case I end up someplace where I have to wait or I'm bored or just whatever. It's like, I'll pull out the book and that's it. I'm good, you know. You can leave Very me there gosh. for hours. <laughs> but that Whatever I travel, work. if I'm, if, you know, plane or, or I wrote to, you know, someplace, I will take a book and everybody else is on, on their device and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not going to run out of batteries on my book. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I don't have to worry exactly. about that. Exactly. And that's 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 the way it is, you know. And you know, it's, it's, and I know that, you know, it's like, sometimes you feel like, you know, I'm a, you know, because, you know, my field of study has, has always been human behavior, you know, and I tell everybody, you know, I, I'm totally a hundred percent on board with technology and advancements and everything. But I think that to be normal, and I'm going to use that word loosely, normal human beings, you need a connection between other human beings. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. That isolation, and I know some people, you know, are more outgoing, you know, like the party person. And I know there's people that are a little bit more withdrawn because of their personalities. You know, not everybody has to be, but this, I see that that, I think, like emotionally and everything, um, I think that that becomes a problem. And, you know, a lot of times, unfortunately, you hear about a lot of these teenagers that they end up committing suicide and you know, part of the bullying or the isolation, I think, is in part due to not only are you isolated, you're really isolated. You know, there's no that, you know, even if it's good or bad, just that interaction, that kind of stuff is, you right. know. Right. Well, yeah, right. I, I'm worried about, about you know, some, some you know, young younger people, you know, not being able to have any, any sort of, um, you know, not being able, able to have good interpersonal communication skills because mm-hmm. they haven't had to. Yeah, no, exactly. You can escape it or you can be pretend who the pretend person that you are. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know there's a, you know, a lot of these games now, you know, you have basically a character that you name and you give it. And it's a lot of them like live through this character gets to the point where, you know, especially these online games where you have like a whole, it's a complete character. And a lot of them really identify with this character it becomes like they're, you know, I know they call it uh, Avatar, but in a way, yeah, it is truly more than just for the purposes of a game. And I don't know, I, I think I personally think that that's that's not a good thing, but that's just Marlene's theory. <laughs> but anyway, so after you had that experience, did your family ever see anything like that again over there? Uh, no, I, n- I never saw anything. They they didn't. I, I said nobody, nobody in my family had seen anything. So they were like, and how did your, what was, what did your parents think? Did they think it was a UFO or what was Oh, uh, the UFO. I was going back somewhere else. Uh, no, they didn't. My, my dad was, he was a farm guy. I mean, he, he was, he was an, an educated guy. He got a, he got his college degree and then, you know, so, but he didn't like thinking of, you know, of, of, of things like that. My mom right. was a little bit more open, open to it. Mm-hmm. She was always always talking to me about, um, uh, you know, that she believed in ghosts and she believed in, you know, there could be something like Bigfoot out there and she believed that there could be UFOs, um, even though that is the only experience she ever had. Okay. But, uh, a matter of fact, she was so open and we talked about it a lot because she knew I was interested and she was so open to it. She died eight or nine years ago from lung cancer. Okay. Um, uh, smoking's bad. Just throwing that out there. She... Um, on on yeah. when she was in in hospice, she she said to me, Jason, I'm going to go soon, but don't worry about me because I'll be fine. And I said, Mom, I know you'll be fine. Just don't come back and tell me because you'll scare the hell out of me. <laughs> so she promised that she wouldn't. Yeah, it's so later after she'd passed. Um, I was doing some writing in my office, um, which was dedicated to the basement, which is where it always is. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I heard my wife shout from the room, uh, the second room in the basement, and I thought she was hurt. So I jumped up and ran in the other room. Okay. And we hadn't lived in the house too long, and she was standing there. She had been unpacking a box, and I, I asked her what was wrong. She, you know, looked surprised. She looked kind of shocked. And I said, "What's wrong, honey?" And, she, and my wife's name's Kim, and she goes, "Your mother just said Kim in my ear." Oh. And I said, "Why'd you shout?" And she said, "Well." I'm unpacking this box, and I just told her 
Bert, because my mom's name was Bertha. We called her Bert, or they called her Bert. Uh-huh. She said, Bert, I'm too busy right now. So wow. I felt good that mom kept her promise to me. But I was going to say. She talked, she talked to my wife, so that was okay. Did that ever happen again, or was that a one-time nope. deal? That was it. She she let us know she was okay. Yeah, and that's, again, you know she kept what? Her I've heard of me. that, and I think even though I, I'm kind of like on the same – belief system is like you know what i i don't want to especially from somebody that's close to you it's like uh, i don't want as a lot of people think oh well i would love to have confirmation it's like no not really but you know i've heard of people and i say that's okay you know family members that drop in every once in a while or maybe on an anniversary you're cool it's the ones that don't ever go away that that's when you realize i've got a problem on my hands right. you know and and you know what jason you run into a lot of people that because it's a family member or a spouse or a child they don't want that spirit or that ghost whatever you want to call it to move on you know what i'm saying and i say yeah but i mean that's that's just that's and i've got uh friends um um when when they got married, um, her the, the the wife's grandfather had just just passed, right? And he he smoked a pipe, mm-hmm. and it was a distinctive t- smell, a distinctive type of, of tobacco. And her husband kept waking up at night, smelling that tobacco smoke. Mm-hmm. And he it would eventually, you know, wake his wife up and say, "Would you please tell your grandfather hey, yeah, to exactly. go in the other room because I can't sleep with him smoking in here." Right. And think about it. How how else can you account for something like that? Right. 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 Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's, it's because it's a, a specific smell to that person. Hmm. And that's your first clue when all of a sudden it's not like one day you smell it and you go, "Okay, Grandpa, drop by to make sure we're okay." It's like, you know, grandpa's sitting in the room every night and I have to smell his stupid pipe. And to me, it's I tell people, you know, I know that there's an emotional tie there, but it's not good for you and it's not good for them. Something's tying them here and you need to like either ask them or pray for them, give a mask, whatever your beliefs are. But them hanging out here is not a good thing. You know, and besides, it's got to be born for them. You'd think it would be. Well, it's, you know, and from what I understand, what happens is basically you still have your consciousness of who you are, but you just don't have a body anymore. And people know, you know, nine times out of 10 can't really hear you or see you unless, you know, maybe you got a sensitive in the family. But like you said, that's got to be boring. Plus, you're seeing everybody going on in their lives with a body and you're like hanging out like. You know, probably becoming really frustrated and, you know, unhappy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would think. And that, you know, that, that's what I tell, like I said, a lot of people that, that, that think that, oh, because if it's a family member or, or I've, had, I've had others which have told me, well, you know, especially if they've got an, an older house and it turns out that it's the original builder or the owner. Well, it's okay. And I'm like, no, it's not okay. <laughs> you know, maybe that person built this house or whatever their time has come and gone you know and if you keep him around guess what he's going to drive you crazy because you're always going to be the outsiders as far as this person is concerned and i guarantee you eventually it's going to get worse you know the phenomena that you're experiencing you know move him on let him go tell him to leave and just tell him he's got to go whatever into the light you know whatever your belief systems are and and, uh, you know, I, like I said, I've had a lot of people that that um, that unfortunately they they think that they can coexist. And uh, I've heard too many um, situations where that doesn't that doesn't turn out to be the case. So, like I said, that's based on my own experience. So let me ask you, something, Jason, what is the last book that you've written? What was the last book that you wrote right now? The, the last book or the last book on the paranormal? No, the last book. What's the last book you wrote? Last book, uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, I got a, had a book of uh, short horror come out. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it's, it's called um, Road Closed, and it's uh, yes. 12, um, yeah, 12, 12 uh, stories of horror slash, uh, slash science fiction that are, are bloody and sometimes scary, sometimes funny. 
Okay, perfect. Because I mean, I put a couple of the covers of your different books up on one of my slides, and I'm sure my viewers are going to see it. But I wasn't sure if that was your last one. So, yeah, in that, other that words, was, you went into the latest. into the fiction for for that. Right. Yeah. I'm, all of my books. Because um, yeah, I've written you know books on the paranormal. I've written a humorous travel book, mm-hmm. um, a parody a parody survival guide called How to Kill Monsters with Common Household I saw Items. All that. I now that you reminded me, I looked at that. I was like, this has got to be so interesting just with that title alone. Well, yeah. It's it's I you know I was one day I was sitting at home thinking you know. If a werewolf burst in here, what would I have within four feet of me to fight it off? So it was fun just picking out different types of entities like that and figuring uh-huh. out, uh, you know, how I'd be able to kill them with just random things around the house. So what would you do if a werewolf burst in on you? <laughs> well, the first thing I'd do is throw the cat at it. Yeah, okay. that would keep it occupied for a little while while I could, I don't know, grab grab something a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit, you know, a little bit heavier, like a baseball bat, or maybe douse it with vodka and throw a lighter. Hey, you know, that's that's pretty good. So let me ask you, just out of curiosity, what do you? What's your version of the werewolf? Are we talking like the Wolfman, or are we talking? Really, werewolves like what you see, like either in the Howling, which was came out in the eighties, or these later versions where they're like mega, mega, mega werewolves. You know, uh, I, st- I, I stuck with with the more traditional uh, European model. <laughs> oh my god, more man than than uh, werewolf per se. Than, than wolf, but you know, they're they're still you know pretty hairy and howl at the moon. I also have a. Uh, uh, a, a chapter in there on the Monster Killers Defense Fund, uh-huh. you know, because a lot of these monsters, uh, werewolves, vampires, um, your evil twin from a different dimension, oh, wow. uh, killer robots from the future, all of these can look like a human being. And if you accidentally do kill a human being, what you should do legally to protect yourself. <laughs> So I'm trying something. to cover all my bases. I blame a lot of stuff on that evil twin from the parallel universe all the time, especially when it's not something agreeable. It's like, was it me? It was my evil twin, you know? Right, so, right. <laughs> so in, now that you said that, do you believe, and I know that physics is proving it, do you think that whether it's UFOs or cryptids or, you know, well, the ghost, not so much, but do you think that, that there is something as other dimensions or parallel dimensions or parallel universes? It's, I mean, I've, I've always loved that concept. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I, was a, when I was a kid and, um, you know, watched the Star Trek episode Mirror, Mirror, where they were transported over to a different dimension right, and Spock yes. and Fear, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> ever since I saw that, I've been fascinated by the concept of, of, of parallel dimensions. Uh you know, are 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 there? I mean, I just I've loved that scientists have, um, you know, have come out and say, you know, said yes, there there are, there are, right. And you know, and since there are, I hope the me from those dimensions is doing okay right now. Um, <laughs> but I uh, mean, it's will we contact with them? You know, maybe maybe we have. Maybe that's what what shadow people are. Um, okay. You know, maybe that's what people uh, are always talking about, time slips. Well, maybe it's mm-hmm. a dimensional slip instead. Well, you know what? It. I think it's, I mean, I don't think it's totally out of the realm of possibility. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar uh, that movie. Well, they based it on a Stephen King. I think it was, I don't know if it was a full, the, the mist, the one where, you know, Hollywood always does their version of a, of a written, but where basically, mm-hmm. you know, they have that rip. And because they're, you know, they're they're doing something they shouldn't in the lab, and basically they're allowing all these creatures from another dimension to come into ours. And this is not a parallel. This is not like where everything is the same as here. It's like where you have these creatures that are they're horrific, and we have no, you know, everybody there is just having a hard time coming to terms with what that is. Uh, do you think that there are dimensions out there that are not? parallel but that there are rips that that's why sometimes historically you'll have groups of people who will for a period of time all claim to have seen this certain creature that's like what is that and then it just dies away well right they're very well i mean that would 
I, I, I hate saying I believe in, in, in something, but mm-hmm. think, I mean, there very well could be something like that because there are so many cases of, I mean, for example, the, the, the green children. I'm sure you, know, you might be familiar with that. No, I'm not. Tell me about experience. the green children. Well, I haven't heard I'm, about the green children. All right. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, a lot of, a lot of people in, in your audience are. It's, it's, it's a story, um, that in, uh, in England, I believe, uh, this village, they discovered these green, these children that were in, that were coming out of a cave and they were green and they, they couldn't speak, uh, English. They spoke a weird language. They were terrified when they saw these people, they wouldn't, uh, eat reg. They wouldn't eat. They eventually started eating, uh, uh, eating vegetables, I believe. And the, 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 the boy, there was a boy and a girl and, and, and the boy eventually died. The girl, didn't she learned how to speak English and and was talking about coming from someplace else? Then okay. they came through it in 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 the cave. You know this could be a lot of things, but it could also be. I mean, you know, in, you know, dimensional travel. It could be. Uh, right. uh, it said dimensional travel with. Um, um, oh, I'm trying to remember <laughs> the Skinwalker Ranch. Yes, uh, that that case because there have been a a lot of weird things happen there. Yes. Um, one one that you know specifically I find interesting is is, is what they described as a dire wolf, mm-hmm. uh, which is a gigantic wolf that you know died off during the the, the Pleistocene era. Right. That um that had that had appeared. You know that you know dimensional rift. Yeah, maybe. Although I don't want to go to that dimension no. if it's populated <laughs> by dire wolves. Like like this. But, like, but let's the, keep that separate thing going on. Right. I mean, there are, there are tons of cases like that, that that I could bring up that, you know, that could be an explanation. You know what? And, and, and I tell everybody, you know, the paranormal is not strictly just ghosts and stuff like this. These are all different areas of the paranormal, which to me are personally are fascinating. And I know some people say, oh, that's really way out there. And I'm like, no, it's not. You know, it's way out there. It may be entertaining and maybe some of it is fantasy or fiction until the one day that something happens and then... It's not, you know, and I personally think that our ability to uh, envision all these possibilities is what allows humans to basically um, invent or bring into being uh, the, the things that we have. I mean, if you look at some of the really old science fiction writers, some of the stuff that they were describing, which now have happened, you know what I'm saying? And oh, back, absolutely. When, when they were well, writing could- it, it was like that nut, you know? <laughs> Well, let's look at. I mean, I mentioned Star Trek. Let's let's look at back oh, at. Yeah. Let's look at the original S- Star Trek. You know, a lot of scientists today grew up on that, mm-hmm. and they wanted to invent the things that were in Star Trek, which, yeah. you know, which which some you know things the things have the, uh, um, you know, the the three and a half inch floppy disk <laughs> looked just like the the disks that they used. The uh, the desktop computers looked like the the computers that they used. Yeah, um, on the bridge. It, and all the right. other Pe- stuff. People are, you know, scientists are working on uh, uh, transporter technology. The, the yeah. 3D printer is, is sort of a Star Trek sort of thing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, the, star, the, the science fiction writers think things up and then you know, people invent them. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, Asimov, when he came up with, you know, all these robot stories about, you know, the, uh, you know, artificial intelligence actually becoming sentient, you know. I mean, when he wrote that, it was like, forget it. You know, well, that's that's a nice story. It's interesting. But even now that we're, you know, that we're going more into building artificial intelligence, there's a lot of people thinking, OK, what if this thing becomes self-aware, you know? Something right. Well, I just lines? read a I just read uh, read an article. I believe it was in the Atlantic Monthly uh, this week that it was it was it was on that it was it was talking about. You know, we're the AI we're working on, and as soon as we decide, um, as soon as we figure out how to make it as smart as a human is, we're all screwed because it's going to, you know, whatever task we've put at it, it's going to, you know, figure out better ways of doing it, and that might not involve having us around. You know what? About, I want to say it was almost a year ago, they came out with a movie. I think it was, even though it was, it was uh, you know, the actor spoke English. It was produced, I want to say, out of Sweden. And it was called Ex Machina or something like that. And basically, the premise... Right, and was, I have not seen seen that. Let me tell you something. And 
I'm not, I don't want to do a spoiler, but at the end, you know, at the beginning, you know, it's along the lines of artificial intelligence and harnessing it. And of course, that artificial intelligence that looks human, you know, that they're developing, but inside underneath the thing. But at the end, you realize that there's a lot of pitfalls that we have in our humanity that once that artificial intelligence basically is unleashed, it'll put us absolutely <laughs> like on, on, it'll basically turn around the relationship of creator and, you know, the, what we, we, we build. It's, it's, it's an, it's a very, really interesting movie and it, can't, it, it really didn't get that much exposure. It went to the theaters, but it does explore like what happens, you know, when the artificial intelligence doesn't have all the pitfalls that we have as human beings that we have, you know, even though we created them. You know, I, I'm. Hey, I've seen the Terminator a lot of times. I don't, I'm not ready for this to happen. No, no, no Skynet to go. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but you know, again, you know, I think that it's, you know, it's uh, the the people that think about these things that when when they write or when they invent it or the it's like, man, that's really way out there. But I think that's that that's the the seeds that all these uh, inventors they germinate from. You know, and then you take it from there. Some of them never become reality, but others, yes, they do. Well, right there. Well, the um, uh, invisibility uh, shielding that they, the you know, the the army's working on for tanks. Right, the cloaking. You know, that's right out of the you know cloaking device. Yeah. The um, uh, I read something once that a uh, an army general uh, don't remember the name, but took when he saw the movie The Predator. Yes. Took took the movie. To, uh, you know, to to the scientist was it DARPA I think, and said and showed the part about the you know the predator being able to disappear. He's like, I want that for my sh- my soldiers. Get yeah, to work it's on. like yeah, I want them to be able to blind in. It's like yeah, wow. And you know what? For all we know, they have come up with something like that. I'm, I'm a I, I I will admit I I do have I I am kind of a conspiracy theorist in some areas where I believe that there's a lot of stuff, especially with weaponry and stuff like that, that we never f- know about. Or find out about that they're developing in you know in places. And as a matter of fact, about a month ago or less, I was talking to a professor that he um, basically what he teaches is bioethics, okay, at the university. And you know, I asked him, and he goes, "Well, this is you know because of all these experiments, because there's no other word for them that they're doing now in these labs. You know, there's a, like the ethics of it." I said, can you give me a for instance? And he goes, well, you know, especially if you're a private lab and, you know, not a university and, you know, if you have part of your lab in another country, for example, where you don't have that much oversight. He was uh, telling me about where they were basically trying to splice together human and pig DNA. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Okay, this sounds like the island of Dr. Moreau. Right. Well, there was a, a scientist who in Australia a few years ago who had applied for that. He wanted his basic thought was if if he could you know uh, build something human enough to think, but not human enough to give rights to that that could be all their soldiers, all of their labor laborers. You know, it'd be cheap labor. Oh you know, God. and if they they went out on the battlefield, they could shoot the enemy. But if they got shot, who'd care? You know what? Us humans, I don't think that. I, I look. I asked him, and 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 he says, "Well, you know." He told me, he says, "the the main lab is here, but they have where they have carry out those experiments are in Spain. In other words, like basically, they put these satellite, I guess, laboratories out of the reach of, you know, let's say in the United States, if they have certain regulations, where because he says that there's certain laws about things that you can and cannot do, you know, especially when you're talking, you know, experiments along those lines, you know." And he says that's how they get around it, and I was like, "Oh, you know, I don't like." To me, it was like, "Oh, I don't know." To me personally, that would that would be so disagreeable, because it's like, and I said, "Well, what?" I said, "Why would they want to do that?" And he goes, "Well, mostly they just want to prove that they can do it, you know, mm-hmm. that 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 if they 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 have the the technology to to actually do that." And I was like. Okay, I, you know, see that that's the times like you're hoping that whoever develops the technology is like. Got some type of conscience, or is not a psychopath? <laughs> Unfortunately, a though, bit I think there, it all but... <laughs> goes hand in hand. Yeah, but uh, on the point of of um, 
the military uh, or, or science has these things already that you know, and we don't know it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that absolutely. I'm, you know, probably a lot of things that we see in the sky that we think are yeah. extraterrestrials are probably us. Yeah. Um, I, I remember uh, I went to college in Central Missouri. Uh, Whiteman Air Force Base was really close to to where I went to school, and and that's where the the B two you know the stealth bomber mm-hmm. was uh, was first deployed. That's where it's still deployed. That's its home base. But they'd had that technology that they'd worked on in secret for years. Yes, that's what I've heard. And I saw. Uh, it might have been 2020 or you know 60 minutes or there's probably 60 minutes uh, a story on this brand new bomber technology that they had and it was on the B2 and and a week later I was out on the highway and I saw the B2 and I was just so happy I'd seen the news report because if I hadn't seen it this craft that looked like something Batman would fly that was flying silently over my head you were thinking oh my god that's it we're being invaded I would only. Yep. Aliens are, are you know, they're here. They're here. They're taking over. <laughs> you know, you know what? And and um, I remember when we first started going over there in the nineties. You know, we went to war over in the Middle East. You know that we actually they pulled out all these weapons that everybody was like, "What is that?" You know, all these drones and all these these this weaponry that nobody had. I mean, really. Before then, we hadn't had a war that we had gone to war for a while. But I remember it was like they were coming up and they had all these planes and all this that it was like, wow. And don't get me wrong. I understand the reason for secrecy when it comes to like weapons. Yeah, I I get it. But it was stuff that like it was like, so what else do they have? You know, and I'm thinking, okay, that's just they they pull out only as much as they need to. And the rest is put away. You know, nobody right. knows. Right. Well, about yeah, it. I, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd love to see what they had, <laughs> what yeah. they, what they have right now. It, uh, yeah, who, who, who knows? Who knows? Well, I. But then again, on the other hand, I don't want to see because that means we have got an- another war. That's the only time no, they bring I know. it out. I don't, let's. I don't even want to think about that. Let's like. I'm gonna. But I'm gonna get on to more. What I think is really hopeful news. That. What do you think about us going to Mars? That we're gonna. Uh, be I have something. been. Really excited by all the private space, uh, you know, the companies going, the private companies mm-hmm. uh, making plans to go into space. I am really excited about this. I'm excited about uh, potentially them being allowed to go to the moon. I never thought, yeah. <laughs> never thought that would happen. No, uh, you know, and 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 the plans for them to to go to Mars. I I would love to. I've wanted to see this ever since I was a kid, and I would love for this to happen in my lifetime. Oh no, I remember that. What was it? A few months ago, when they said, "Well, we think we found signs of water on Mars," I said, "Okay, we're going to be the next Martians, folks." To me, that's what I read it as. I know I'm being like really, really hopeful and broad, but it was like, you know, I know that there's a lot of challenges, but it was like we're going to be the next Martians. You I know? hope so. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. would be incredible. Yeah, that. that and, and it was really. Uh, I mean, the the amount of people who are excited about it, I thought was really cool. Um, when uh who was it was it musk who planned to have a one-way uh you know we're going to colonize mars but it's going to be a one-way trip um i don't remember which billionaire decided to do that i know but there's the, the virgin there's branson he's got his thing going on also and oh but yeah what one of them who who did it uh for the one-way trip to mars oh i don't uh, know about was, that one was, okay well it was it was it was we're going to colonize mars uh we're going to send up all the uh you know, all the equipment, and then we're going to send people there. But the problem is we can't get you home. But we're oh. looking for people to sign up. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people applied. You know what? I was about to say, I wouldn't, but then I said, shut up, Marlene, because you know what? I bet you there's a bunch of people that that did, and I'm sure they would have to probably, you know, a lot of them would be unsuitable, but I bet you amongst all the bunch that did, they could find the ones they need. Well, and I looked through, I mean, I looked through the applications because it was open. It probably still is open online. And there were some people who were like, you know, I want to go because it's so cool. But, you know, there were scientists wanting to go. There were journalists wanting to go. There were, you know, there were actually qualified people. Well, no, that's why I'm saying. I know I was thinking, okay, you know, after my first thought of like, oh, that that, that no round trip part, I don't know about that. So I'm thinking, okay, you're going to get a bunch of people that they're like, no, no, not you, not you, definitely not you. 
And I said, no, you know what? They're probably going to have so many that amongst all the ones, they are going to have the ones that they're like, definitely, we're going to send you, you know, like, and uh, because, you know, basically the odds are you're going to filter down to the ones you need. And like you said, you've got people that scientists, journalists, but I don't know, you know what? That part about no round trip or like, it's like, oh, and that's the thing. It, I imagine from what I've read that, Life would be really, really difficult, you know, for whoever were to be the first colonist, if that's what you want to call them, out there. You know? Oh yeah, it, it would have to be. And I mean, it, it, it's a it, it's a it's a death sentence. One little thing goes wrong, everybody's dead. Yeah, I mean, the novelty can wear off really quick. Really quick. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jason. Thank you so much for this interview. It was fantastic. I loved it. I loved it. You know. Um, I've put, I'm, I'm including a link to your website down in my the credits. You know, like I said, I've included uh, uh, some of the, the books that you've written, you know, and, you know, I think it's great for somebody like yourself that you, um, yeah, you had your own firsthand experience, but you've gone out there and you've interviewed all these people. Okay. And I think it's great also that you're like, I want to keep my distance from the paranormal. I want to write about it. And I want to hear people's story, but that's as far as I want, because I think that that brings like a level of objectivity when it comes to talking or writing about, you know, the paranormal, because unfortunately, and you, and you know, you said it, you know, a lot of times whenever anything paranormal or UFO or Bigfoot is presented, it's always the, okay, it's the nutty story. Here we are, you know. Right. So it's nice when you have somebody like yourself that writes, even though, like you said, you've written that that book about, you know, you know what you would do to if you had to, like, you know, fight against a werewolf. But, you know, and personally, when I read all these different books about ghosts and paranormal events, I love the ones that have interviewed everyday people. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or have gotten stories from people that. Some of them, I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you're the first person they'd ever told, you know, about that experience because either telling their family or their coworkers, everybody look at them like, oh, okay. And those are the best, to me, that lends the most validity to the possibility that absolutely that there is life after death, you know, or that, you know, without knowing the exact thing, unless you're dead, you know, that, that we're more than just our bodies. So. Right and well and I'm I'm first and foremost a journalist so I, I I'm a storyteller I tell I I tell people stories uh, the best way that I can the most unbiased way I can and 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 I hope hope my stuff comes out like that and and you know if I'm if I if I can convince somebody that that this story that they just read was true because wow I had an experience exactly like this yes and that, believe it <laughs> no, or not there's a lot of people better. that go wow you know. Well, which is something that I found out after it was just you know pulling teeth to to do to write to research my first book because people didn't want to talk to me because they were no. afraid they'd be laughed at. But no. after that book came out and people realized that I take this seriously and that I treated everyone I interviewed with respect, you know, I had people coming out of the woodwork to tell me their stories, which yes. was welcome. I, I I loved that. Yes, and I'm telling you, I've done paranormal research for a long time. And I tell everybody, I, I belong to what I call the underground paranormal research, which is I would have a lot of people come to me through third persons when they had something going on in their house. They really weren't sure because they realized I would not talk about it because some of them were really either scared or they just didn't know what they, you know, contrary to what everybody thinks, like, you know, now that everybody wants to be on a reality TV, there's a lot of families out there, or individuals that the last they, thing they want is for anybody to know that they've reached out for help with something they can't explain going on in their house. And, um, you know, you learn, like, you know, there's a thing as confidentiality and that it was like, you know, absolutely, under no circumstances would I ever divulge anything. And like I said, I didn't, and I didn't arrive at their house with a boatload of people and, you know, and all these gizmos and stuff, you know. I would probably go by myself or one other person and, um... Because, like you said, there's a lot of people that have a hard time actually admitting that they had that experience, especially if it turned out to be really scary for them. 
So right, right. Well, and and you're right. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who want to be the center of attention. They want to be on reality yeah. TV or a YouTube but star. I mean, that's there. I think I still think most of the people in the world just want to be left alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the people, and then and then there's some people that it's like, and those are the ones that, like I said, that usually I'm not gonna say always, but usually when you got there, they did have some stuff going on, and they just really had no. They were at their wits end. And by the time they would call somebody else and it was like, okay, you know, but please don't, you know, nobody's going to know about this, right? And you're not going to talk to anybody about this, right? And I was like, absolutely not. You could tell they were, the last thing they wanted was any type of anything um, to go on. And, uh, you know, again, and and like you said, you, you experienced that firsthand when you were trying to get stories or eyewitnesses to talk to you. And then I'm sure that after a while, maybe... Did you ever get that person who knew some other person that, you know, would bring them to you and say, hey, you know, talk to him because he'll actually listen to you and not either laugh at you or make fun of you or, you know, any of the above. Right. Yeah, I got I got a lot of that. I really did. So, you know, that speaks volumes. You must be a very good journalist then. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> okay, Jason, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the interview. It was great. It was wonderful. Okay, I will keep track of your books and hopefully bring you on in the future. Okay, All right, so I'd be happy to. I had a really, stuff. really good time on the interview tonight, and thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. Take care. And what? sometimes I lose track of the days. It's almost the weekend. Have a good weekend. <laughs> All right, you as well. Bye-bye. Okay, good night. Bye-bye. Good night. So, another interesting person on Miami Ghost Chronicle Stories of the Supernatural. I hope you liked it. I liked it. I love speaking to all these people. You know, and, and, and again, you know, um, I consider him, he's an expert because I'm going to tell you, even though when you talk to him, he hasn't had uh, this, he's not an investigator. He doesn't go out and, you know, you know, like he said, he went to the Velisca house, but that was part of a project that he was doing with the class he was teaching. Okay. Um, that to me is great because he's been out there getting stories from all these different people and what i think is really interesting is when you listen to a person telling you a story you're not there to judge is it true or is it not true you know did you imagine it was it a bad dream you know you're there to listen to this person tell you what happened to them and then you you know you take it together and you know you put a book and Speaking to him, this is the impression I got, you know, which is why he eventually he had people coming to him and telling him probably, who knows, maybe people were telling somebody for the first time about experiences they had, probably even maybe when they were kids. Why? Because they, there was no judgment. There was not going to be any like, you know, well, you know, that kind of like, you know, you're not, and that's there's a lot I'm telling you I I know this for a fact for all the people out there that have that talk about all these paranormal there's a bunch of people that have had not one but many 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 paranormal experiences that they never talk about it to anybody you know or or even their family members for different reasons Um, you know and and it's something sometimes they carry it around with them. So I think that when they find somebody like Jason, you know, that maybe he'll, he, maybe he even offers some anonymity. Hey, I'll change your name, you know, instead of Anne, we'll call you Mary, whatever. But tell me your story, you know. I think it's like a little bit of psychotherapy, you know, for those people that have been holding it in. Anyway, again, uh, I, I listed some of his books, you know, and I think he... <laughs> that book about different ways to kill a monster that's 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 priceless that's just just great um i think that um again when you speak to somebody else that does work in the paranormal that's not an investigator but has talked to people okay again even though he had his own personal experience which was quite impressive okay that it 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 tells you that to me, you know, again, short of capturing the proof that the scientific world wants to say, yes, there is life after death or there are ghosts or whatever. When you talk to some, another person, you realize that there's got to be something out there, you know, 
And maybe we'll never, ever, ever have the final answer until we passed on. But to me, there's comes a point where the facts or the evidence becomes so much so that it's like, how can you not believe that there is something beyond when our body dies? That's my personal belief. So when every time when I talk to somebody like that, it's like, see, here's another one. You know, he's a journalist and he's a professor and he teaches journalism. And, you know, and look at him. He was like, hey, I want to write about it, but I do not. I don't want to ever see a little kid again. I didn't want to see my mom. What does that tell you? This guy was not chasing ghosts per se in his own personal life. So you could tell there's a degree of spe- skepticism for him, you know, um, related to a skepticism v- very much mixed in with I, I, I already saw one. So I know that it's real. So, again, I hope you like this show. I hope you subscribe to my channel. I hope you hit the like button, please. Come back every Friday at 7 p.m. You know, to see what my next show is. Um, and, of course, in between, I'm going to be doing my my own uh, field investigations. That that takes a little bit more time because it takes a lot more editing. It takes a lot more stuff, a lot more research, especially into some... To bring you, like I said, stuff that's fresh, that's different, not the... You know, like here in Miami, everybody's gone to the Biltmore. Like, well, okay. You know, uh, things like that. You know, I'm trying to look up some new and interesting places to bring to you. And I'm hoping to travel also as well. I've got a a few paranormal groups that want to hook up and for us to do some some investigations together. They're like in central Florida, a little bit further up north. So I just got to coordinate those visits. And of course, I'm going to let you bring that to you guys. So again... I hope you all have a wonderful weekend, okay? And I hope everything is great for you guys. Take care. Bye.